This is Thank You Mama Weekly Lessons for Mothers All Around the World. Dear friends and listeners, hello. I just wanted to very quickly share with you my excitement about the Thank You Mama workshop which took place in Vienna last weekend. It has been a dream of mine for many years now to see what would happen if I transferred the magic that happens in these beautiful interviews into a personal interview and especially with a group of women. And it was just amazing. (laughs) We spent two and a half days, Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday, meeting each other, bonding meditating with art, showing a mother figure, uh, walking through Vienna and discovering important mother figures and women figures in Vienna. We basically did what we do in the interviews. We wrote about our mothers and their lives. We talked about it. And then we wrote about their most important lessons and the lessons they were not able to teach us. And we talked about these as well. And at the end, we also wrote about mothering ourselves. We were thinking and discussing ways we can give ourselves either what our mothers were never able to give us or can't anymore because they're not here anymore. The weekend was just magical. We ended up having a spontaneous dance party. We had a little concert because one of our lecturers Antonia Patek is also a pianist and after telling us about perception biases she sat down and started playing her own music and her songs about her mother and um, we spontaneously started dancing. Anyway it was a beautiful beautiful very first workshop and I'm very excited to know that it's a very healthy seed and definitely something I want to develop in the future. If you're interested and want to stay in touch, do contact me. You will find my contacts under the website tider.com and subscribe to the newsletter and I'll keep you in touch about the future workshops. It would be amazing if you could meet us. They are magical. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Thank You Mama. My name is Anna Titer. My guest today is Dr. Katarina Rebay Salisbury. Katarina is a prehistoric archaeologist working at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And her main research interests include the archaeology of the human body, gender, identity, and personhood as expressed through funerary practices and art. I can't wait to hear more about this. Katarina specializes in the Bronze and Iron Ages in Europe. And uh, (laughs) and (laughs) I just, before I I let you talk, Katarina, I just wanted to introduce your paper called Bronze Age Beginnings, the Conceptualization of Motherhood in Prehistoric Europe, which I'm excited to talk to you about. And... You're a mom of two boys. Um, welcome. Welcome, Katarina. Thank you, Anna. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I am so excited to have you here because I'm always excited to have guests who also who research on motherhood from different angles, you know, and and to learn to learn from them about what they've learned about motherhood. And I can't wait to hear from you about motherhood in Bronze Age. And I loved how in your paper you're writing about this idea that we have of natural and ancient parenting practices and I'm curious to to hear more about it. Are we idealizing all of that? Yes, that's right. So I'm a mom of two boys myself. They're seven and nine at this point. And when I was having Daniel, my elder one, um, I was still living in England. And I was just shocked by how different the childbirth experience was there 
as opposed to what I was used to um, having been raised and lived most of my life in Vienna. Um, so I had my second boy uh, when after we had returned to Vienna. And it was really interesting to see how everything about childbirth, the expectations to mothers, the way how you breastfeed, the way how you uh, organize substitute care and so on, how different this is, even in the sort of more or less same cultural background uh, between England and Austria. Um, so I, I, I got really curious and I wanted to know, well, how is this in prehistory? Prehistory in a way is also a foreign country. It's just a, a <laughs> much... Um, um, much more removed in terms of time rather than uh, space. And uh, so I was starting to get some information together on how motherhood would have been organized in the past. I, I was just asking really simple questions like how old were mothers when they first had their children? How many children did they have on average? How did society react to this sort of transition to becoming a mother? I found this was a very, very intense experience in terms of a real identity change from being a woman to becoming a mother. Mm -hmm. And and I wanted to research how, how this identity change would have been um, perceived in the past. Can we go that far in the past, Katarina? Is it possible for us to find this out? Well, there are certain things that we can do. And archaeology is at the moment in a very fortunate position that there is a real exciting toolkit available from ancient DNA analysis to isotope analysis and from, from you know, um, doing thin sections on T's to C14 dating. So, so we can get a lot of data and facts together that help us in trying to understand motherhood. Mm -hmm. What I focused on in, in my uh, research project that was funded by the, by the ESC for five years. So, so I had quite a, a, a lot of time and, and uh, resources available to research this. We, we try to understand if having children giving birth actually changes something in the anatomy of the human pelvis. There is this idea in physical anthropology and in osteology that the childbirth actually leaves traces on the skeleton. And we were trying to understand these changes in the pelvis um, of the female skeleton through time. So we looked a lot at osteological material and see what kind of physical impact um, childbirth has on, on the women. Because it is still at the end of the day a biological process that affects women deeply and mm -hmm. that also has implications for nutrition, implications for the well-being of mothers and children. And uh, a little bit of this we can see through the bones of the people that were buried in prehistory. Mm. So what we're looking at is we're looking at graves and we're trying to analyze as much as we can of the skeleton. And then we try and relate this um, information to how people were buried. In prehistory, it's often the case that how people were valued in the past is expressed through the effort put in the grave construction or in uh, all the grave goods and objects that are given into the grave with the person. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to find a relationship between these burials of mothers mm -hmm. with how they would have been seen by the society. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was a very interesting work also because often you hear from, from certain circles that advocate natural childbirth and so on, that, oh, yes, it's all a natural process. And we've just sort of, modern medicine has just sort of uh, let us forget how to do it. And, and in prehistory, everything was wonderful and fine and women didn't have any problems. But that's absolutely not the case. Mm. Yeah, We have in the archaeological record, we have mothers that died in childbirth with the fetus in in the body still. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, We have people that... Uh, have signs of treatment of, of gynecological problems. Yeah, for instance, prolapse of the ut uterus was 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 a quite common problem for people in the past. Yeah, and you are able to find all of this in the bones. That I'm yeah. quite yeah, flabbergasted. Find, That's no, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also find evidence for for gynecological treatments and wow. things like that. Yeah. So we we also have mothers and children buried together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Child mortality was incredibly high in prehistory. Mm. We estimated around that f almost half of the children who Oof. were born didn't mm -hmm. survive until age five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
these children were often buried either together with the mothers or together with other adults uh, expressing different kinds of relationships mm-hmm. and these are the things we've been looking at in 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 my project mm-hmm. so we're learning it wasn't as easy as we imagine now yeah. we are glorifying this old and historic and ancient and natural Exactly, yeah. And mm-hmm. this this comes from a romanticism that actually never was. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. prehistory, you wouldn't want to go back and live in prehistory. It was <laughs> no. <laughs> it was a quite hard and brutish place. Yeah. Katarina, and have have women's bodies changed so much? I mean, this is part of this whole conversation about why so many women get C-sections nowadays, why is giving birth seems to be harder on women have our bodies there are theories that our hips are tighter than they used to be well i think there are several factors at play one is we're definitely not as fit as people in prehistory we're we have way we have not enough exercise we don't have enough muscles we have far too much body fat on average we are we are probably not as healthy we have our children far too late the optimal reproductive age for women is, I think, 22. Yeah, mm. it's not. Teenage pregnancies have been problematic in the past as well, mm-hmm. but the optimal age to have children is your early 20s, and not like I had my children around my 40s. So, so. me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's biologically not ideal. Let's put mm. it this way. Yeah? Mm. There's also other factors. For instance, I mean, we've basically cancelled out ever any evolutionary effects by applying C-sections. So previously women would have just died in childbirth if yeah. their hips were too narrow yeah? mm-hmm. and they wouldn't have had, they would have had children. Yeah? So there's definitely an evolutionary trend to make childbirth more difficult over time. Mm-hmm. And that's something that uh, shouldn't be forgotten by, by modern practitioners because it's not going to be easier. Mm-hmm. There's no point in returning to mm-hmm. a state that never was. Because of our, we are constantly still evolving. Yeah, I think this is so important to to remind women of because we do have this idealized, uh, romanticized, as you said, idea of childbirth and natural childbirth, and you shouldn't get a epidural, let alone have a C section and be ashamed of it. So I'm, I'm yeah, very this, glad this that is, this is totally ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It's also, I mean. Yes, we can have natural childbirth, but then we also have to factor in all the children that that, that have real problems because they didn't get enough oxygen during the birth and have mm-hmm. mental issues later. We have to factor in all the ones that die. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're willing to do that, then then go with yeah, it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think we have we, we are trying to minimize the risk for both mothers and children. Mm-hmm. And for children, the risk is definitely greater than mm-hmm. than than for them, but but still. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are certain conditions that you would, that even in prehistory, because it's hard to compare. Yeah, We don't have many of the things mm-hmm. that would, would manifest in the bones. We, of course, can't see in prehistory. Mm-hmm. Yeah? But we know that things like uh, preeclampsia, for instance, or placenta previa, yeah? mm-hmm. these these are prevalent in, 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 in all societies. And there's not really anything you can do for or against it. This would have just been a percentage of women that died anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Katarina, do you know I was surprised when I read about first C sections that they were they were done such a long time ago. I don't have the the age in my head now. Do you know that around what t- what time? Well, the question is what you actually call a C section. C sections were basically the last resort when you knew the mom was dying already, then you tried to get the child out alive. Yeah, okay. it, it had nothing to okay. do with the mother. And yeah. C-sections like that were actually performed from antiquity. So, uh, so the Romans also, and also talk about it. That's um, that that this would have been performed if nothing else. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, for instance, in in the in the Roman period, it was always clear that the life of the mother would have been privileged over that over the over that of the child Mm -hmm. so if if childbirth got really wrong then um, there is gynecological techniques to cut up the fetus in the womb to try and get it out and save the mother's life yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 
it's yeah, it's it's all a bit gruesome. I don't know why we started with yeah. <laughs> with uh, such gruesome <laughs> themes in the beginning. Um, no, let's 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 go into nicer yeah. themes. I wanted to learn a little bit more about you before we start talking about your mom. So you are Austrian. You grew up in 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 Austria, and you've spent a lot of yes. time in England. Yes, that's right. I. I had a sort of very uh, traditional Austrian upbringing and uh, did my uh, master's and my PhD at the University of Vienna. And then I, I got a sort of really chance invitation by a friend of a job that was very close to my PhD topic. And then he said, hey, why don't you apply there? And I, I just first laughed it off. But then I, I did apply and I got this job as a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. And it was really fantastic. I I learned so much and it was so intellectually stimulating and interesting to be there. And I met so many good friends and I also met my husband there. And yeah, it was it was really, really a, a wonderful, exciting time for me. Mm. And then I wanted to stay in England and I got another postdoc at the University of uh, Leicester, a five year uh, job. And that that was also a very 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 nice place and very good work. And um, I met I had met my husband in Cambridge, and he moved uh, with me to to Leicester. But then he struggled to find a job, and that that's kind of interesting because he is American, so his first language is English. But it's mm -hmm. not so easy for Americans in England. Kind of like mm -hmm. it's sometimes not so easy for Germans in Austria because mm -hmm. it's sort of the same kind of power relation. And and then he got a job offer in Vienna. So oh, this is how you came to Vienna. That's yes, funny. That's I thought how, you moved because returned. of you. No, but no, not at all. <laughs> and I was like actually really quite sad to leave England because I loved living in England at mm -hmm. the time. Mind you, this was before Brexit and before kind of things mm -hmm. got a little out of hand. So so he accepted this job in Vienna, and we were very fortunate that we could rent a house just opposite of my parents' house. And that was a huge help then, because at that point I had like a, a one-year-old and I was pregnant with my second child. Mm -hmm. um, and to have family that close mm -hmm. that helps childcare is, is, is unbelievably important in the early years. Okay, and now we nicely came to start talking about Mama Monica. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Can you tell me about her? Yeah. So... My mom's name is Monica. She was born in 1940. So that means she's over 80 now. She's like 82, I think. Yes, that's right. And uh, her mother was uh, was Czech. She she was born in, in Jilava. And her father uh, was Austrian, but uh, lived in uh, what's now southern Italy, in, in Bolzano. So I, I'm sort of the last uh, remnant of... of Uh, of, of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy because I, all my four grandparents were sort of from the crown lands rather than from <laughs> Vienna. But that was very typical for, for the generation before me. But my mom had me relatively late. So, and I had my children relatively late. So, 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 so the, tie, the generational spans are just a little bit uh, wider. Yeah, so my mom was a child of the war, of the Second World War. She, she still remembers... Um, The bombings of Vienna and how mm. she had shelter in the in the cellars and 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 she still freaks out when she hears the sirens. Mm. So this is a very sort of deeply ingrained experience that that I think sticks with you for for the rest of the life it if, does, if yeah. you have once experienced it. That makes me makes me all the sadder to 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 think about when we when we see all these terrible pictures about Ukraine. I know, I know the generations of of. People who are going to be marked forever, you know, it's a trauma that you can't, you you can't release anymore. Absolutely. Oh. So because of these circumstances, my mom, who was actually sort of the second uh, child of my grandmother, was not raised by her own mom, but she was uh, sent to, to Southern Tyrol to, to live with a paternal grandmother mm -hmm. and that was actually very common in for, for for the generation of viennese children they were all everybody tried to get the kids out of the bombing zones and tried to you know stick them to any kind of relatives or any possibility to not have them in the cities that they were mm -hmm. bombed 
Mm-hmm. So my dad's family was similar. He was sent to to a children's home in in the Austrian Alps, yeah. and 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 everybody of that generation had had this kind of fractured family connections and um, and and disrupted family lives. Mm-hmm. So anyway, after that, my mom kind of did was it what is it was expected of 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 a woman at her time. She she went to school. Because she had to earn money relatively soon, she she did an apprenticeship as a knitter, but she'd also always loved children, and so she trained as a children's nurse and and then worked as a live-in nanny until she married my dad at the age of um, uh, 25 or 26, I think. There's also this really interesting story that my parents hadn't known each other for a long time before they married. I think from getting to know each other to to marrying, it only took them three months, which I think is. <laughs> It's kind of funny, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> still kept... <laughs> my parents knew each other for a day. <laughs> wow, that was also um, uh, pretty quick, yeah. If they thought they were being very funny. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom was uh, quite quite uh, close to her paternal grandmother, but I think she was kind of on a mission to to always create a loving and functional marriage and family. And I think this is what, what I would see as as her legacy yeah my parents marriage is still going strong after 55 years and with them both being over 80 and and my mom always tried to to create this very close uh, family relationship mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so my parents have have three children my sisters are 10 and 11 years older than me and they also both have two children, so so we're all, I think, uh, quite close to each other. But does it mean they they coupled well, or does it mean that they just knew how to deal with rough patches in a marriage? <laughs> I think it's a bit of both, mm-hmm. right? I mm-hmm. think it's also a bit of having the plan that this is it yeah mm-hmm. that this is a commitment mm-hmm. for life and we're going to mm-hmm. go through thick and thin and we're going to stick it out if there's rough patches and and we still come back and have fun together and 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 express a love to each other but i think you have to really be determined to do this to actually make it work yeah it's a constant process yeah one of my guests told me how she learned from her mom that a marriage or love is hard work. She's like, it doesn't just fall into your lap. You really have to work on it. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I think this is, I, I was brought up in, in, in quite a Catholic way. And, and the idea is that if you marry, you are in there until your death or uh, there is no elf. Yeah? <laughs> there, mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. there is, uh, there's not really a, a, a different uh, possibility. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying that everybody should stick together in an unfunctional no. and, and abusive yeah. marriage or anything. Yeah, far from it. But um, but I think you have to have a plan and 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 do it. But then your parents started a business. Tell me about that. Yes, um, that's right. My parents were always quite uh, inventive, and my dad is uh, an engineer, and he is was very interested in telecommunication. And um, this was way before the internet and and so on but there were there were machines built where you could send messages from one end to the other and and this is what my parents did and they sold um communication machines all over the world and it was quite interesting company so i saw the whole process because we lived in a house where the bottom floor was the office and the um, the the, sh- the shop basically where my dad built these machines, and then there was this office front, and my mom did the organization and the administration, and she was also the boss. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So f- that was quite unusual at the time, but my mom is in a way a little bit of a natural leader, mm-hmm. um, so she was very good at at, at sort of at the relationships with with both customers and with the employees and so on, mm-hmm. and. So, so I actually grew up in in a very female centered environment with my sisters and my mom in a girls' school, and 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 so for me it was sort of natural that that my mom would be the boss of the family and the company, but 
I then realized <laughs> that this was absolutely not normal at the time. Yeah? Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. rarely had any uh, friends whose, whose moms worked. Being a housewife was very common at the time, but also or, or just having sort of a small sh uh, job to supplement mm -hmm, the family mm -hmm. income, but, but not in a kind of leadership uh, position. And I also remember many instances when, when customers talked to my mom and, and, and asked to speak to the boss and, and she kind of just smiled and said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here I am. <laughs> exactly. But tell me, how did she juggle having three daughters and being a boss of, a, of her own business? Well, I think she, because it was basically spatially the same, we lived on top of the, our flat was on top of the, the office, so to speak. Um, it was very easy to, to blend family and work life. And, you know, I would come home from school. My mom would come up and cook. Uh, I would do my homework. She goes down and does some bills or whatever. I come then down and, and work a little bit in the office. So it was because my mom was self-employed, much easier, of course, to handle than if, if, if she had worked in, in, in an office or so. Yeah. But also this, this kind of was inspiring to me because I think it is important to model how family and careers can, can be combined. Mm -hmm. And she is today a happy 82-year-old. <laughs> and I heard from you how she's still very active and supportive and helping. Yes, very much so. So my mom always loved children a lot. And, and sort of her love of children later projected on the grandchildren my sister's kids are born when I was in my late teens and my early 20s. Um, so I never quite understood it at the time, but but my mom always focused very much on what the kids had to say and always listened to them. And, and the needs of the children were always put first. Yeah? And much later, I actually understood how much valued and loved this makes the children feel and how important this mm -hmm. is actually for a, a functional family environment. Yeah, and today, so, so when I moved uh, back to Vienna, my mom took care of the, of the babies and children whilst I was working. I was working from home most of the time, so, so it's just across the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, and and she, and she 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 was a huge help, and she's still very engaged where, with with picking up the kids from from school and and helping with the homework and and sort of looking after them when we have uh, evening appointments and things like that. Yeah, so I don't know how I would have done my career without mm -hmm. the help of my mm -hmm. parents, and and also because I really love my work and it's so much of my identity. I wouldn't have wanted to to be to be at home and mm -hmm. and, and look after the kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that in comparison to my mom, I'm actually totally terrible at this parenting business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the patience. I don't have uh, you know. I I just don't enjoy reading the. 500th time the same book so so i'm actually looking forward to my kids becoming teens where you can have like serious conversations <laughs> and discuss things with them um yeah but that that here you jumped into my question what do you think you what do you wish you had learned from her let's let's hear what do you feel like you've learned from her actually there's so much that it found i found it really difficult to have it boiled down <laughs> to, to a few points yeah but but I think I think the most thing, the, the most important thing is that, that she really managed to convey a sense of, of the importance of strong family ties, yeah? of, of of loyalty towards the family that that takes many forms and that also is very important to build self esteem. Everybody feels loved and appreciated. So so creating this family environment. Which also, for instance, includes uh, preparing food or cooking. Mm -hmm. I think these, mm -hmm. these, this, this is something that, that definitely um, that she modeled, and that I hope I can at least do a little bit of, <laughs> even if I feel I'm not very successful sometimes. Uh, yeah, and also what my mom did is, is certainly um, instill a love of learning. Mm -hmm. So reading and learning, experiencing and traveling was 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 very much part of my childhood. 
And I think my parents, my parents' business also didn't always uh, work brilliantly. So there were lots of sort of ups and downs mm-hmm. financially, and 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 so so one of the things that kind of stuck with me was that that money and property, you know, they come and go, but but what you've learned is with you for the rest of your life. And I always remember this a little bit, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that, that something that you've learned, nobody can take away from mm-hmm. you. And so you became an academic. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> you took it to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> but also I, I learned that motherhood and careers are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about this, how my mom ran the business. And there was always this flexibility involved mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that you can blend the the work life and the family life. And, and I'm a big fan of this flexibility. So I find often that, that as a as now as a as I'm sort of a team leader, I, I see that when 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 my team members become mothers, how often they are marginalized and they're excluded from things because they have their baby in tow, yeah? mm-hmm. or because things are scheduled at family unfriendly times, mm-hmm. or because of this and that regulation that doesn't fit with bringing your your child, yeah. And I think this is this is really problematic. I think as moms ourselves, we we need to create a work environment where where you have this flexibility built in. I mean, it doesn't matter to me if 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 my 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 team members if they want to take the afternoon off to spend the time with their kids and then sit down when they're asleep and and work some more. That's absolutely fine for me, yeah. Mm-hmm. Who am I to organize their lives? But I think there's also a lot of trust involved that you need to 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 trust people to do the right thing for them. And in each individual circumstance, this might be different. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Austria is a very overregulated place anyway. And I find that many of the labor laws that are intended to protect employees are often actually doing the opposite. Yeah, that they are kind of hindering. Uh, combining careers and 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 motherhood in in a good way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that if you let everybody work in their own style as much as possible, people are happier, people are more productive, and they're more loyal to your project or company or, or whatever. Yeah. But this so, is what we learned through COVID. I think with with yes. working from home. You know, when COVID I remember. Has Absolutely. When I had my corporate job, we were officially allowed a day of work from home in a week, but you could not even dare asking for it. Like that that was really looked down upon. If you asked to work from home, it meant you were slacking and not working. You basically, you would, you're yeah, getting a day so off. Wrong. And now we learned exactly. Now we learned how productive people and how happy they are if, if we allow them. The, yeah. the the freedom and the flexibility that's great yeah. and i have to say i mean i i take my home office days so i can finally focus on my work and not be distracted by everybody coming in and asking questions this is also part of my job yeah mm-hmm. you have to also ad- advise your team members and mm-hmm. discuss things mm-hmm. with them of course yeah this is this is fine yeah but if i want to actually what i feel i'm most productive when i'm writing my articles when i'm preparing my talks things like that and that i can only do at home really yeah, yeah. exactly Katarina, let's talk about what do you feel she wasn't able to teach or if there was anything you wish she taught you. I think one of the things that I just observed over the years is that the focus on family often meant for my mom that it came at the expense of of, of, of really true, deep friendships. So I don't think my mom has has very close female friends and as we get older and busier it becomes more and more difficult to to maintain friendships and create new ones anyway so so I think this is something that I couldn't really learn from her and I'm also not really sure if 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 I'm successful at it at all yeah I have I have friends but sometimes I wish I had sort of this this deep intellectual emotional connection to to people other than my husband and and I'm not quite sure um how to go about it. Yeah. Mhm. Mhm. Is it just friends or is it also hobbies and other things outside of the family? Yeah, so so, so uh, notoriously in my family, my mom is like the one who's like totally unable to relax and uh, not do anything. So 
for years we've tried to to get her to sit down and enjoy a meal. This is not possible because she has ran back and forth from the kitchen to the dining mm -hmm. table five hundred times. So um, I think I think this is also one of the drawbacks of being sort of such a stimulating, engaged person is 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 that that you find it very hard to wind down and relax. But my mom actually does have hobbies. So, for instance, she I think when she was already retired, she did a writing course and she likes to write books mm -hmm. and she likes to take pictures and photograph. And she mm -hmm. always makes little photo albums for my kids. So each kid gets a um, personalized photo album of the year of what they did together with uh, with the grandparents. And this is really sweet because my kids love to sit down on the sofa and look through this and remember Aww. the stuff. And then we had you, you sent me another thing you wish you learned, but you already talked about it. <laughs> what was that? I can't remember what it was. You, you said that somehow you, fe you felt inadequate as a mother sometimes uh, because you're not, you didn't learn this interest for children. Yes. Yes, but I think we are all a little bit different. And yeah, my interest, exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean, I love my children to bits, and I, I think what I, but, but it's even that because because I'm an academic. Yeah, I often see this through this intellectual lens of seeing them grow and their sort of uh, developmental stages mm -hmm. and trying to understand this in relationship to their psychology and their environment and so on. So I find it endlessly fascinating. Yeah? It, but it's a different kind of interest in a child than the child should actually have from the parents, which is, <laughs> let's have fun together, let's yeah. play together, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's experience something together. Yeah? <laughs> and, and that, for me, gets boring very quickly, mm -hmm. to be honest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I like to travel and then now the kids are old enough that we can travel together and experience things together. And that I think is hugely rewarding to, to see it through somebody else's eyes and see the world through, through, through sort of the wonder of fresh experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think this, is, this is wonderful. And I like the way to understand how they think and think about how, how they perceive things. Yeah, I, I also find it, difficult sometimes for instance my, my oldest son is now nine so he's old enough to hear from school about ukraine about and and in his eyes it's also simple yeah so there's the bad guys and the good guys and mm -hmm. they fight and somebody wins mm -hmm. but there is never a winner in a war yeah and there is i i, I can't see how anything good could come of of, of the situation yeah and, and this is very difficult to explain to a child mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Because the world is so complex. It's very complex, yeah. Wow, Katarina, is there anything else you'd like to add? But but maybe 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 I would like to add that that I love my mom very much. I learned a lot from her. I'm very grateful that I had her as a mom. And I really hope that that I can give back something at some point, for instance, to my own grandchildren, right? <laughs> it's beautiful when it trickles down to generations. Yeah. We inherit traumas and wounds, but we also inherit the love and and attention and wisdom. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, can we just quickly recap mm -hmm. lessons from Mama Monica? So we had the importance of strong family ties Oh, but look, to the children. now yeah. I found something very interesting rereading this. <laughs> <laughs> but dealing with difficulties often means to distract rather than discuss and solve. Yes, I, I think this, this is something in a way of um, what do you often do with, uh, you know, when a toddler stumbles and, mm -hmm. and falls and you say, oh, here, here, look, there is a nice uh, butterfly. Check it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this, this works extremely well with small children. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work so well anymore with older children. Mm. And it's a little bit dysfunctional <laughs> in adult relations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's definitely, um, it's sometimes not a bad strategy. Yeah. yeah but it's not yeah. always the right strategy. Always the right one. And at some point, you need to kind of so be more analytical about it and see mm -hmm. what's sort of the underlying problem and and, mm -hmm. and try to tackle that. Mm -hmm. And 
and in the first instance, it's often quite difficult because you know the emotions are there and and, and things are not super smooth. So so what do you do? Yeah? And then looking at the next um, nice butterflies is, is is perhaps not the best. Strategy. Knowing when to tackle things that's yeah, that's yeah. important. Yeah, I'm also a little bit torn, for instance, about. Um, and I think there are different schools of psychotherapy and so on, but but sometimes trauma are better not discussed too deeply. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's 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 a fine line. There are That's there are things line. where it's better to sort of patch over and get, get on with your life, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there are things that need some more attention. And and to get this right, I think is is a constant um, balancing act. But I don't recall many instances where my mom for instance said okay let's all sit down and discuss this problem yeah. this is this is not how our family worked it's more mm -hmm. like that in passing you know you would kind of hint at something and mm -hmm. you would always try and go back to 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 get on with each other mm -hmm. i think one other thing that that i remember is when when i got married one of the things my mom sort of said as an advice to 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 a good marriage is sort of never never go to sleep without a good night kiss and sort of having to at least patched up towards that level yeah mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. so don't the, go to sleep with a grudge of, exactly mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and i've been trying to do that but mm -hmm. not always um easy that that then we <laughs> to discuss at 10 o'clock in the night that you yeah. don't really know <laughs> 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 so so we had we had the family ties but also knowing when to dig deeper and when to discuss things and when not we had we had uh the love of learning and i love it how you were taught that money and property come and go but that what you learned always sticks with you that's that's so important then we have as a lesson that it is, is possible to combine motherhood and a career. We just have to figure out how. Exactly. And and we as sort of senior women need to make it possible for the ones that have the children now. And this, this bit of female solidarity is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And then as things you wish you learned from her was how to have close female friendships. I already also wrote down how to relax. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm doing uh, yoga now. <laughs> yeah, Not very regularly. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you said you did not inherit this interest in children. In, in not at this in, at this in, very young age and different no no I play. think at a different level. It's just yeah, sort of a different level. kind of interest that, that I have. Is there anything else we need to add? No, I think that's 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 pretty good. There's there's tons of things that I learned from my mom, you know, from yeah. the cooking yeah. to to ways of speaking to it's it's really hard to to single certain things mm -hmm. out. But I thought mm -hmm. these were the ones that that are probably the, the, most, the most important ones. At this point, yeah. <laughs> Katarina, thank you again for being my guest. This was really interesting. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. I'm very curious what you make of it. <laughs> After all the editing and cutting and so on. <laughs> if you enjoy Thank You Mama and want to help it grow, please take the two seconds to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send me a mail at info at thankyoumama.net you can also find me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter under Anna Tider, that's T-A-J-D-E-R. This was Thank You Mama. Come back next week, subscribe and tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs>